So uh, to all the participants from the World Investment Forum who are tuning in for this session, I'm very honored and pleased to be uh, just delivering a few brief opening comments. I don't want to take any time from the esteemed panel that we have of some of the world's uh, CEOs of major stock exchanges around the planet, um, all women discussing gender equality in capital markets, the role of exchanges. Uh, the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative has been doing a lot of work on gender equality in capital markets for years now. And more recently, we've been joined by the IFC in a very strong partnership to more fully expand this work around the world. And so we're honored to have with us Mary Porter from the IFC here today. Mary, it's good to see you. Um, and I'd like to hand the floor to you to moderate this panel. Great. Thanks, Anthony. Welcome, everyone. It's great and apropos to have six female CEOs of stock exchanges here with us today to discuss the state of gender equality in listed companies and the role of exchanges. While it's increasingly recognized that advancing gender equality through business operations and value chains means better talent, higher productivity, more customers, and better societal outcomes, change is clearly not coming fast enough. So I think to achieve the SGGs, we're really gonna to need to find ways to move a, a lot more rapidly. Stock exchanges are an essential component to making this happen. They influence markets and help facilitate inclusive economic growth. They're the ultimate connectors, bringing together policymakers, investors, and businesses, and they can drive sweeping change in a way that few other players can. On a global scale, there's power in numbers and in their collective action. Every International Women's Day, I'm struck by the sight of more than 100 stock exchanges around the world ringing the bell for gender equality. This is, event has been happening for years now as part of a global partnership that IFC and the Sustainable Stock Exchange are engaged in. This partnership with the SSE has now broadened to produce the G20 report that we're gonna discuss here today with a view to cover all 100 plus exchanges under the SSE umbrella. The data will be reflected in a database that's currently under development. Also underway is a toolkit for exchanges on promoting greater gender equality, along with a joint global training program to grow the pipeline of women leaders. Awareness is clearly growing among exchanges about the role they play in advancing gender equality. The state of gender equality in G20 markets reveals that progress though remains spotty. While in the top market, women hold close to 45% of board seats, it drops to less than 2% at the bottom end of the range. And across the G20, women still only account for 20% of board seats, less than 6% of chair positions, and only 4% of CEO positions. That said, we are making headway. In our own work at IFC, as part of our broader sustainability agenda, we're seeing growing interest in the regions where we operate. Uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, we helped introduce the ESG reporting guidance um, with the exchange to improve the information disclosure practices of listed companies, including information about diversity, equal opportunities, as well as the percentage of women on boards. In Brazil, we're working with the stock exchange and others in a mentoring and training program to promote more women in leadership positions. And in Nigeria, we're collaborating with the exchange to work with the top 15 listed companies on a series of peer learning activities to reduce gender gaps in employment and entrepreneurship. I think today's high powered panel is a clear reflection that we're in a new era, one in which women are routinely taking their well deserved places at the table. So before we get into our discussion, let me let you know who's here with us. So Delphine Damarzi, CEO of Euronext Paris, Julie Becker, CEO Luxembourg Stock Exchange, Olga Cantillo, CEO Latinx and president of the Ibero American Federation of Stock Exchanges and Security Markets. I think we'll go with FIAB, the acronym is easier. Uh, Diana Chan, former CEO Euro CCP, Leila Fouri, CEO, Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I think we're following each other, Leila. We've been on a couple panels in the last two weeks. And Julie Hodgett, CEO, London Stock Exchange. So ladies, let's get going. I, I'm gonna start with um, Julia Hodgett and, and Delphine. 
the, the SSE's analysis of the gender performance of the boards of the largest 100 listed companies on G20 member exchanges ranked Euronext Paris at number one, followed by the London Stock Exchange at number three. France has legislation promoting gender parity, while the UK has opted for a more voluntary approach. When do you think voluntary approaches are likely to work? And when do we need mandatory targets? Any thoughts? Julia, should we, should we start with you? Well, let, let me give a defense. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. But let me give a defense of, of the reason why I think um, having, having the opportunity to opt in first is a good idea. Um, for me, diversity is one thing, but actually true value from diversity comes from being a genuinely inclusive organization as well. Um, and actually, I think for me, the thing I've been focused on in diversity and inclusion speaking for the last 20 years is really getting institutions to understand the fundamental value to their institutions of being diverse and being inclusive. Um, and I think we, we need to make sure that we never lose sight of that. There is a risk in certain circumstances, I think, where mandation may kind of create the end result, but not the why and the embedding of the why within that. Um, and I think we need to always focus on that. I mean, the reality is, the point at which you might need more in the UK, I think would be the point at which you didn't feel that progress was being made. So when we look at the data for the FTSE 100's current constituents, um, the mean of women on boards in 2011 was 14.3% and it's now 50, uh, sorry, 35.7%. And we've now hit an all time high of non-exec directors of 44.4%. And it's actually gone up two to three to 4% every year. And it hasn't had a year yet since it's gone backwards. So that momentum in, from, a, from a UK point of view does feel like it's building. The other thing that is happening, however, which isn't mandation of the outcome, but it is mandation of the visibility of progress, is that the regulator is increasingly looking at disclosures around women, women's inclusive inclusion on boards um, and in the C-suite, not just on the board. Um, and therefore, the, the role of actually companies increasingly being required to disclose whether they meet a certain criteria, whether they meet a certain um, ratio, and if, if not, why not, I think is, is the next stage in the embedding that we'll certainly see happen in the UK rather than moving directly to a, a number that everybody has to hit. Um, but the momentum feels very much there. Um, I'm going to make one provocative point, um, and uh, I think I have support. I'd, I'd be interested to see what others around the table think. I've been saying this for many years in diversity and inclusion speaking. There is no empirical evidence that men dominating the upper echelons of the corporate world in any country produces the best outcomes. Now, that is actually not a diversity and inclusion comment. It's not even a feminism comment. Um, it's actually a research methods comment. By definition, we've never had a control group to prove it and to prove that the status quo produces the best outcomes. And yet we demand a level of empiricism for change that we don't demand of the status quo. And I think actually it's kind of beholden on all of us to remind people of that fact when we're thinking about this conversation, uh, that this change is not actually as revolutionary as everybody may frame it. Um, and I think it's very important for those of us who have a voice to say so from time to time. Thanks, Julia. I'll let your fellow panelists uh... <laughs> tackle your provocative comment or not as they so desire, but maybe we'll move first to Delphine and see what, what she's thinking. Yeah, well, I think it's a provocation we will all agree with, uh, honestly. Um, not exactly in defense of, of the mandatory requirement system, but, but explaining our experience. Uh, so in France, we do have a, a mandatory requirement of uh, parity, as we call it, uh, of the least uh, represented gender, we which usually is the female one, up to, um, uh, to, to a minimum of 40% uh, in, in, in board seats in, in bigger companies and listed companies uh, since 2011. Before that, there was an effort, uh, uh, I would say, uh, peer pressure and, 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 uh, and um, self-regulation uh, self that, that made us grow from 8.5% uh, of the board seats in the, in the first 120 listed companies uh, so 8.5 percent is not a lot, up to 20 percent. But then it's stalled, and in a country where you don't really have a culture of quotas, 
uh, but so it's really not what, where we come from. But we do have a preference for legislation in general. Uh, there was a, a big discussion and we ended up with embracing quotas uh, per, per legislation. That was the move. And if we talk, you talk now to, to female uh, uh, in, uh, in boards and, 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 uh, and younger generation, they will always tell you, you know, they were not particularly in favor of it, but they have recognized, they have to recognize it, it enabled changes. And the, dis the, the discussion, you, you, your provocation, Julia, on, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> having the control group, we are more or less kind of uh, building the control group in boards uh, now. So there are a few tricks. Huh? Uh, this, 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 there are still differences. I mean, we are uh, now in the, this 120 uh, up to uh, almost 44% female. Uh, still not that many chairs. Uh, chair, chair, chair. We don't have to say chairperson so much as we continue to say chairman. Uh, and uh, I would say a compensation between the roles. I mean, you, you add more women by... Uh, using uh, the bucket of independent directors. That's where you usually have a trio or quattro of, of female to, to compensate for uh, the um, traditional guys nominated by the controlling shareholder or the, the executive directors. Uh, so that's, you know, that's in the way, but I, would, I, will, I will take your bait on, uh, on research. And because I was, uh, when I first joined Euronext back in March, I was uh, immediately pushed into a women's panel because my nomination was a lot advertised um, as, as a kind of symbol, uh, important symbol in France. And so <laughs> one of my first public appearance was on a women's panel, panel and it continues, I'm very happy too. Uh, but it was very interesting because it was, it was actually researchers who had uh, something to tell us with data. And their main conclusion on board was that there was a fear that because you had to find women and there were not that many women who were on the market for that, the level, the level would decrease, uh, the level of uh, competency, et cetera. And that's not what happened. It's quite the contrary because the old club were suddenly uh, very motivated to, to be sure that the standard would be kept up. They, they put very harsh criteria and they did find some women. And in contrast, if you look at, at data, the experience and the curricula of, of women on the boards is actually a bit higher than, than those before. Who, for some reason, the standards was not that big before because you know it was a given that there were good board members. So I don't know if I matched the provocation of July and Julia, but probably so. I, say, I think in this process, the fear of losing the standard was quite the contrary because as usual, women are a bit put to a higher standard. Now the conversation in France is moving to a another difficult area which is the uh, the executive committees the management committees and how to ensure that there's a fair representation and here it's a bit different because that's where i think you should still use more suasion and persuasion than probably a, a rule because there you're less you're to a certain extent you have a notion of collegiality as in a board but a bit less so and so um it's more difficult to impose i would say a ratio when you still have to have the perfect person in this role and that role. And of course, collectively, it's good that there is parity, but then you really have to make a, the proper choice. And so it's more for me working on changing the, um, uh, the reason why uh, there should be a, a good reason and a good uh, uh, pool of uh, candidates of both those changes. Sorry, I take up a little bit more than my time, I suppose. We'll let you stay. Don't worry. <laughs> so, Leila, turning to you, the, the JSC was the only emerging market exchange that featured in the top 10, in fact, above the G20 average in our analysis with an average of just under 30% of female representation on boards. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's the secret? What was your secret sauce? What role has the JSC uh, exchange played? Thanks, Mary. And um, I'd just like to say, just reflect back on, on the panel before I answer your question and say what a wonderful privilege it is uh, to be counted among so many uh, global CEOs of exchanges. And I know that this is just a, a, a smaller representation of a, of a much broader female CEO trend that we're seeing beginning to take hold in the exchange business. 
Uh, so it's really a, a, a wonderful honor to be part of, of the panel. Um, so, so Mary, a gender representation has certainly been um, one of the strengths of uh, the South African corporate environment. Though it reflects much more of a broader dynamic in South in the South African society, and JC listed representation, as you say, is above thirty percent, and in fact, it was the highest, as as you uh, mentioned, in the emerging market space. But yet, I, I do feel we've we've got a long way to go. Um, within the JSC, we embrace that wholly, and our representation at board level um, is 65%, uh, and at our EXCO level, we have 75% women, which means that the, the men on, on EXCO really uh, struggle to get a word in edgeways. We obviously in the country come from a history, a deep history of racial oppression, and at the dawn of democracy, there was a very conscious choice that was made to fight discrimination in all its forms, including uh, gender discrimination and um, other, other forms. And um, this led to a choice that, that was made and, and entrenched in policies, um, many of which at a government level have driven um, gender representation much more widely. And it's, it's not just a, a, a wide range of, of, of um, policies that have affected business, but it's also reflected in government. 46% of the members of parliament are women, for example. I remember when our president, um, Thabo Mbeki, two terms ago was elected and he appointed more than 65% of, of his cabinet as female. And I found that to be a, a powerful embracing of what was in legislation and a very important symbolic message that tended to become embraced and, and, um, and, and, and fully supported in, in business. So the policies that um, we've uh, adopted encourage companies to implement uh, plans to improve both race and gender diversity in their business. And we're now 28 years into um, the after apartheid life, and you can see that the impact of these policies is taking hold. However, we still have so much more to do. And the environment has, has made it appropriate for the JSC to support these efforts. So for example, our listings requirements require entities to have a policy on the promotion of um, gender and racial diversity at board level. And companies are required to, um, uh, to, to share in the annual reports how they've considered and applied these policies and how they're progressing towards voluntary targets. So the figures that you see for representation show the progress of companies that they've made in setting these targets and working towards them. And uh, I sincerely hope that we continue on this trajectory um, until we reach full and, and appropriate representation. Thanks for that. Olga, given your role at, at Latinx and, and at FIAB, it'd be interesting to hear your sense of the state of gender equality in, in Latin America. I spent a lot of my career living in, and working in that region, and also some reflections on, on what roles you think exchanges and industry associations can play. Thank you and good morning to all. And it's also a pleasure to be here and be sharing with this fabulous panel this morning. Mary, I'm gonna to stick to FIAT. I'm not gonna say the whole name, <laughs> it's easier, but I'm just gonna explain what we are. Uh, FIAP groups 24 stock exchanges and securities markets from Latin America and from Spain, Bolsa de Mercados Españoles. And um, unfortunately, I have to say that women's participation in our securities market in the region in Latin America, it's very slow, it's uh, very low. It's a male dominated industry but we are having uh, or making some improvements, especially in the securities market, thanks to all the guidance and all the principles that as stock exchanges that are either uh, members of the SSE 
or the World Federation of Exchanges, we need to follow. And that includes uh, SG uh, 5, gender equality. So that is a good step for us. However, uh, I have to say that um, in FIAP, we only have three women participating in either the boards or as CEO. We have one woman sitting in a board and we have two women CEOs in FIAP. However, I do have to say, for example, there's a second exchange in Mexico where there's also a woman CEO, but they're not part of FIAP. So we may have more representation, but not as part of our federation. However, they're not the more, they're the less. So we continue to have the same challenge. Um, in Panama, since I'm the CEO of Latinx, I will like to share our experience as well because it's a whole different story. Since the beginning of the exchange, we've had participation of women in our board and in executive levels. And we've had two women sitting in the boards of the group. I am the CEO and we have more than 30% uh, women executives in our company. I have to do say that it is mandatory for all regulated companies to have 30% of women party in uh, their boards, but we were complying way before that law came into place uh, last year where we had to have a minimum of 30%. And it has improved in, in having that parity within women in the industry but not, as, as it was mentioned before, it's being uh, included with the independent board members, not necessarily sitting in the board or having uh, more and more uh, participations. And I do have to agree with the panelists that uh, came before me. When, when you think about why is the reason behind we have to prove ourselves or even if we are more prepared or have the curriculum to be sitting on that board. And then I was thinking yesterday when I was in a panel here and uh, it's so easy for us as CEOs, women, to be able to play the role that as stock exchanges, we need to play with gender equality because we're here, we're sitting in the chair of the CEO and we can move whatever it is that we need to move to make it happen, or at least possibly make it happen. What happens when the CEO is a male who does not believe in gender equality or not necessarily understands why we need to have gender equality? And then we have a sustainability manager who's struggling because her boss is, does not, or his boss does not believe in gender equality or the board has a hard time believing in gender equality and even worse, the shareholders. So that is a, a big challenge. And in that sense, I'd like to congratulate the SSC because the SSC is working on a guide that will give us the ideas, the initiatives and the steps that we need to follow in that sense. And that, that I believe is what we need in Latin America. Instructions on how to do it and make it faster. And is it mandatory or not? I think it will need to be mandatory in order to move faster uh, in complying with SDG 5. Thank you. Thanks, Olga. We're gonna move to Diana Chan now. Uh, Diana, while you were CEO of EuroCCP, you launched an initiative focused on women in market infrastructures can you share with us a little bit about what was driving this at the time? What were you hoping to achieve? Uh, and, and what sort of progress do you think has been made thus far? Well, back in 2015, that was when the idea first uh, materialized. Uh, I was the CEO of EuroCCP, but few financial infrastructures had women at the top. Um, I met a new CEO uh, of CSDs uh, who was just promoted to her position and she was going to be the CEO of the CSD, the Central Securities Depository Opposed Trade Infrastructure uh, of Belgium, Netherlands and France. Um, together, 
we discussed the lack of um, gender diversity at uh, the leadership positions uh, in the industry, and we decided that we should do something about it. Um, we thought of organizing a conference to bring together high potential women in the industry uh, and women leaders in the industry so that the women leaders could share their wisdom, know-how, experience with other women in the industry to help those who have not yet made it to the top have an easier and quicker route to where we have uh, arrived. So uh, the first conference was uh, held in 2016. And I call it the first conference because there were four, three others uh, that followed. There were four altogether. But when we did the first one, we actually planned it only as a one-time event. But after the event, all the participants were so ecstatic about uh, the opportunity to learn from the female leaders in the industry that we didn't have the heart to just say this was not meant to be a one-off and the event became an annual event. Um, during the four years, there were a number of CEOs of stock exchanges uh, who uh, came to speak um, on panels on um, specific themes. Uh, and the World Federation of Exchanges had been a, a very active uh, sponsor of the conference uh, from the very beginning. Um, we had the CEOs of uh, Ireland, Norway, Portugal, and South Africa uh, come to speak on the panels. Um, for stock exchanges who did not have a CEO uh, who was a woman at the time, uh, we also had women members of the executive committees of the stock exchanges in Germany and the United Kingdom. Uh, we also had one year the, the, the top regulator in Europe of stock exchanges, uh, the European Securities and Markets Authority CEO uh, came to deliver a keynote speech. Um, the chairman of the Dutch regulator, the AFM could not make it uh, to the uh, event, but nominated uh, one member of her executive board uh, to come and speak. Uh, so it, the, these um, were just the uh, CEOs of the stock exchanges. We also had CEOs of central counterparties, three, including myself at the time, um, and the CEOs from six uh, securities uh, depositories. Um, also, uh, financial uh, infrastructures uh, and very big banks had senior executives who came to speak. The conferences um, were designed to be so-called speed coaching sessions. The idea is to have women leaders share their wisdom and their know-how with high potential women in the industry. Uh, how do we know that our effort had been worthwhile. Um, we, we wanted all the panelists who each probably have to spend at least one day of their life on this event because of traveling um, and preparations uh, to feel that their effort has actually had an impact on the industry. Uh, at the start of the conference, we ask each participant to listen carefully so that they go away with at least one idea that they know will help them in their own career. And one idea, at least, that they could bring back to their companies and help other women in their companies reach their career potential faster and easier. Uh, we also required uh, the participants to be nominated by their companies. And in that exercise, uh, it was rather startling to hear from some financial infrastructures that they didn't have high potential women to nominate to come. Um, and I hope that in the future years that uh, this would not happen again uh, by uh, highlighting the fact of uh, the importance of having a pipeline of junior women who could uh, be, who could be given the opportunity to uh, rise to the top and participate in events such as this. 
Um, for the four years that uh, the conference ran, we had different themes and uh, the speed coaching that the uh, women leaders delivered um, had uh, themes uh, such as uh, aptitude, how to play up your strengths, um, effort, how to maximize results and impact, um, and creating opportunities for yourself. Uh, talent, interest, and effort uh, are all good things, but very often they are not enough. We need opportunities. Instead of waiting for opportunities, how do we create our own opportunities? Um, then there are skills uh, such as uh, how to get authority and influence and how to use it, um, dealing with obstacles and disappointments, overcoming adversity, um, and setting priorities uh, in uh, work and in life. Uh, these are just some of the examples where the senior women in the industry shared their uh, wisdom and uh, experience uh, with those who are uh, up and coming and one day be the next leaders of our industry. Thank you, Diana. Um, Julie, you're the founder of the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which is one of the largest green and sustainability bond markets in the world. And we're of course increasingly seeing growth in social and sustainability bonds. So how are you seeing um, gender themes incorporated into these products? Thank you, Mary. Maybe just just before entering in the in the core of the question and reply it, and then just to take a, to that challenge as well, a provocative remark. Um, I think what has been said so far, I'm very pleased as well to to be able to share this uh, women only panel. I'm sure I'm the, I'm not the only one who uh, who face that kind of experience very rarely. It's uh, it's really rare to be on a women only panel. And, um, and I think it, it is really part of an important element that has been already underlined today, which is leadership. Um, I think if we, if we want to change norms, uh, well, we have all, uh, all of us a clear role uh, to play. Uh, it's a critical matter. The, 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 the tone comes from the top. And uh, I'm convinced that if we do consider discrimination uh, in the norm as not uh, appropriate uh, from the top, uh, it will become the norm and it will not be considered as appropriate at any level of, of the companies and institutions we represent. But uh, at the same time, I also have a regret that we are, we are only uh, a women only panel because I'm so convinced that uh, it should be a multifaceted approach and that teamwork is also extremely key because it's not only about women, it is about men and women that uh, should be part of the same expectations and requirements uh, that the norm actually change. And uh, that's the only way by, uh, that it will change in any way in the future. So maybe in a few years time, we, we will be able to uh, speak about the same topic, but with, uh, within a, a more balanced panel um, until we wouldn't have um, to, to speak about it because it will become the norm like um, finance should be sustainable by default, I hope as well, that uh, we won't need to, to speak about uh, gender balance in, uh, in some 10 years max, uh, at least for the future generation. But to come back to your, to your question um, about, um, about how do we see gender themes incorporated into uh, social and sustainability bond, um, maybe just to, to put this into context, um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, clearly accelerated the focus on sustainability and brought the S of ESG to the fore. Uh, we saw a steep uptick in social bond issuances in 2020, which by the way has continued in 2021. And uh, this is reflected on, on our platform because at the end of September, the number of, so of new social bond uh, issuances increased by uh, almost 60%, while uh, the amount raised through these new social, social bonds uh, increased by 300%. So it's huge compared to the, to the same period last year. And, uh, and uh, social bonds uh, raise financing for areas such as food security, affordable housing, education, healthcare, but also, and uh, importantly, for gender equality. And uh, I could give, uh, give you some specific examples of bonds supporting gender equality, um, like, uh, like sustainability-linked bonds, uh, which are bonds that offer source of financing for companies across all sectors, uh, including high polluting ones to accelerate their transition efforts, 
So companies need to commit to achieving a predefined sustainability objective within a set uh, timeline, and they need to define science-based, ambitious, and measurable uh, KPI and SPT. Uh, and so SLBs are gaining traction in Europe and, uh, and beyond, and companies are committing to, reach it, uh, to reaching both green and social objectives within their sustainability strategy. So one, one great example is the one from EQT, a Swedish investment company, which issued a 500 million uh, SLBs, the first SLB issued by a private equity firm. And it commits to increasing uh, gender diversity, both within the EQT uh, AB group and uh, in its portfolio company boards. So it's, it's clearly setting an example by not only increasing gender balance within its own company, but also driving the push for more gender diversity in the boards of the companies in its investment uh, portfolio. Uh, so this is really important to use that uh, the, the, the power to bring, it, it has the power to bring positive changes so beyond the company uh, itself. Um, I could also illustrate with other uh, example of bonds, uh, upcoming bonds, for instance, from Colombia. Uh, Colombia is, is preparing to issue a gender bonds in the international markets. And the funds will support uh, economic empowerment for women in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, another example comes from ADB, pioneering gender bonds. Um, and then there's a, the proceeds of the bond would uh, help finance a project which uh, aims at promoting gender equality in housing finance and promote affordable uh, residential mortgage loans for women borrowers in largely rural areas. Uh, a last example uh, comes from Canada with uh, Bank of Morrill, which marked uh, the International Women's Day this year with a Canadian dollar women in business bond, uh, which is its first domestic issue of its sustainability framework. And the proceed of the deal will support um, Bank of Morrill's lending to SMEs with a turnover of less than 50 million um, Canadian uh, dollars, where at least one of the owners is a woman. And it also goes to non-SMEs, where at least one third of the owners are women. So uh, we saw also, uh, we see also, um, thanks to these issuances, that uh, the power of investors is so very important and that more and more investors want to, to create an impact through their investments and understand the impact they will have on, on society and on gender equality, for instance. Thank you, Julie. Now I have a couple questions that I'd like to put to all of you. Um, first, uh, in some markets, we've seen the conversation shift from a focus on gender to a broader conversation about diversity and inclusion. Any thoughts on how we bring notions of intersectionality into our efforts to promote gender equality? And maybe I'll just call you out and we'll go back to Delphine because we haven't been with you in a while. <laughs> Um, I think I think the way uh, the, the notion of intersectionality is uh, is a bit loaded in uh, in France, I must say. Uh, but if I if I take it very pragmatically, the way we address it at Euronext, uh, being uh, a pan-European exchange with uh, uh, eight uh, operational uh, countries of operation, seven exchanges in Europe, and uh, more presence uh, in, in with the, a total of 16 countries is by, uh, I would say, pro giving opportunity to people of all backgrounds. And for us, I think it starts very pragmatically um, by uh, not being strict about uh, the background that is needed to, to, to join us. And because we are so diverse in, in, in our countries of origins, we, we don't really understand so, so well as if you are a one country operation, exactly what this or that mean in terms of education and background. So we, we, we feel less about that, but uh, about the person that comes and uh, with what uh, to offer to the company. So if I compare to my country, which is France, and it can, it's, it's sometimes a bit, uh, um, I would say, uh, I can't find the word, but uh, tends to, uh, to be uh, sometimes uh, captured by uh, old ways of uh, schools or this or that. Uh, I must say this new environment that I've uh, moved in in, uh, in March this year feels um, much more open. And this is uh, something that we really invest in also by, by promoting uh, 
so multi-country uh, teams. Uh, we, we, we tend to, to, to have, we, we operate in a matrix that uh, connects the local markets to a, to a common platform. And so we have different uh, teams operating for the whole of the group in different places. And we really push for internal uh, mobility. And so if I go back to, uh, to women, uh, one of our challenge, and I think we share that with some of you, that we are the, the um, uh, cross uh, crossroad between tech and finance, which are two, uh, two uh, <laughs> pools of <laughs> that are not so uh, uh, naturally, I would say, uh, uh, numerous in, in, in women. And so we really need to be able to, to, to be open to, uh, to different uh, backgrounds and, and able also internally to, to shift people between the different uh, areas of, of uh, uh, our, our jobs uh, so that we can also be an actor, not only by, of course, um, uh, you know, provoking more, more candidates uh, at the onset. This is what we do with mentoring, with uh, trying to, to fix targets of uh, recruitment uh, at, at, at the, uh, the beginning of the careers, but also by, by you know, giving opportunities to go towards a technical job or from a technical job. And this is also the case for, I would say, more uh, um, uh, different type of diversity in terms of uh, ethnicity, for instance, where we do we the um, the tech uh, the tech, for instance, uh, uh, jobs are much more diverse in origins than others, and then we we use that uh, that opportunity uh, throughout the group for different jobs, and that's how I think I I can see my intersection internally, but I would say more pragmatic than uh, uh, theologic. Thank you. Julia, we're ready for our next provocation. <laughs> OK, that's my role in this gig, is it? OK, um, look, I think I, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of the word intersectionality because I think it's not the obvious thing that people kind of instinctively understand in terms of what it means. You have to be deep in the weeds of DNI to really understand it. But most of us are. Most of us have more than one sense of identity. Um, and certainly in the UK, the evolution of the conversation about gender has moved very swiftly to one about ethnicity um, and one very much focused on, on really trying to dig down into the experiences of, of different women. One of the things I say, I'll, I'll be provocative again, um, and I feel I have a responsibility to say is that as an openly gay woman who is the non-biological mother of two children, then I get to tick the female CEO, I get to tick the mother, I get to tick the being openly gay. So yes, I, I am intersectional in a number of ways, but actually my life in many regards is structured more like a lot of my male colleagues than my male, female colleagues. And it is entirely possible that one of the reasons I've had the opportunity to get to where I am is because of that. And that illustrates how much more we still have to fix, not that we're there, and that we should be sort of saying that because we've got X percent or because we've got to hear that we've we've solved the problem. And one of the interesting things about the discussion in the UK around increasingly publishing ethnicity pay gaps is if we think our gender pay gaps are bad, our gendered ethnicity pay gaps are horrendous. And one of the things organisations actually need to do is to be prepared to put themselves out there and put the data out there, not because it looks good, but because it's bad as a public statement of a commitment to do something about it and to be open about it and to change the way we have these conversations. I, I talk about it as, as not having diversity and inclusion conversations so that we get to wear rainbow lanyards and have recruitment posters that make us feel like good about ourselves, but actually so that we tackle the hard work that needs to be done and we're honest as organizations about it. Um, and that to me is where the really valuable conversation comes in. It's about institutions owning the problem recognizing what they need to do about it and then taking proactive steps and being accountable for the measurement of the progress that they make. Um, but it's also the case that the issues and the manifestations of those issues will be different in every single jurisdiction. And one of the challenges that regulators face or rule makers face as exchanges is the mandation of what good DNI looks like is not going to be the same in every country, in every region, and it's going to come loaded with different histories and different issues. Um, and finding a way of ensuring that we can raise the bar whilst doing it in a manner that works in every jurisdiction is, I think, one of the greatest challenges that we have. But the final point for me, it feels like, is there's, there's a privilege of sitting in seats like these. Um, and you can either take responsibility to making sure that you make it easier for those who come next, um, or you can pull up the drawbridge. And I think we all have a responsibility to do the former, not the latter. Couldn't agree more. Um, Layla. 
Yeah, and um, thank you for that, Julia. Julia raises some, some very profound points that are, are highly relevant to South Africa uh, because context does matter. And uh, the approach and the application of uh, intersectionality and the manifestation of it is, is highly relevant in, in our country. And South Africa is, is really a very good example of this in action. Uh, we took a stance against discrimination in many forms uh, when South Africa emerged from apartheid, um, as I mentioned earlier, 28 years ago. And of course, the, the clearest sort of legacy of racial discrimination um, is, uh, is, is, is a foundational on this. But our constitution specifically protects against discrimination against a long list of, of discrimination types, ranging from race, gender, sex, pregnancy, uh, through to um, origin, color, uh, sexual orientation, disability, belief, culture, language, many of these sorts of elements, including birth. And amongst other things, uh, it's the only constitution in the world that specifically protects the disabled. And as a result, we, we do have a highly progressive set of laws um, on issues like gay marriage, inheritance rights. And we also find um, it, it very natural to see intersections in these different aspects um, of uh, particularly of discrimination. And uh, for example, while we promote um, racial and gender diversity, our, our regulations particularly encourage companies to focus on skills development and developmental efforts on black women and disabled black people, for example. And this intersectionality is, is very explicit in some of our regulations, but it also arises as companies are trying to maximize their representativity across all of these areas of discrimination, all of which are enshrined in regulation and in legislation. So reporting requirements on your um, diversity profile of the company is, is, a, is a very important and, and key driver in all of our decision making. Thank you, Leila. Olga, any thoughts? Yes, I'd just like to add to what uh, Julia and Leila said. On um, in Panama and Latin America in general, we're like I mentioned earlier, just uh, very low when it comes to gender equality, even lower when it comes to diversity. However, in Panama, because of the challenges again, and in Panama, we do have that in place by law that we have to have diversity. However, in Panama I and mean in Latin America in general, there's not enough data to measure if we're really complying with diversity and gender equality. Uh, in the Latinx in Panama in the exchange, we just launched in April of this year, our ESG guide, but it's voluntary compliance. So we do not have yet enough data to see if our listed companies comply with gender equality and diversity. I think I'm gonna to have to come next year and give you an answer on that. But uh, I do wanna say that it's in place. However, I, I hate to say this, I believe it's not necessarily enhanced. We have a ways to go. All of us do. Diana. I have to confess that intersectionality is a new word to me. Um, I'm learning a lot uh, from this uh, panel. Um, for me, diversity is about many things, not just gender, ethnicity. It's a whole frame of mind. Um, being able to value the opinions and the contribution of people uh, who are diverse in any of a number of ways. We are all used to being in meetings where we are the only woman around the table. I am used to um, working in uh, America and in Europe where I'm the only uh, person of color around the table. 
And when the meeting finishes and everybody gets up, I'm used to being the shortest one around the table as well. Um, so I take diversity as a mindset that we must encourage people to have um, and, and not just trying to uh, be uh, comfortable with people who are just like ourselves. Um, as uh, we on this panel are highly visible in the business world, we need to take every opportunity to play our role as uh, role models for those who are aspiring uh, to move ahead in their career and help them fulfill whatever their potential is by showing that it is possible uh, to get to leadership positions. Um, and I, I really applaud Julia's comments about uh, standing out and showing that it is possible to uh, not be like everybody else uh, and make a, a good career um, out of it. Uh, and I would like to see the education system and start with children and um, make sure that uh, the curriculum actually reflects uh, the um, mindset that we want people to grow up having uh, and us already in the in our working lives and having reached a, a very advanced stage of our careers uh, to demonstrate how being different we have made our way uh, to the top and that it is possible role models I think are very important. Thank you, Diana. Um, and as someone who's also not particularly tall, I'll tell you what my mother told me. Good things come in small packages. Um, so last but not least, Julie. Julie, are can you, you on mute? Yes, now we can. Go Sorry. ahead. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, well, I have to say that, like, like Delphine, I think that in Luxembourg, this is not something which is very loaded also in, uh, in, in, our, in our company, on our culture. But uh, I like very much as well, as Julia explained, I think uh, we are all representing this difference by being indeed role model in our own company and by being not only um, women leader, but also, um, also um, women in, in life and, and maybe most of the time are often also uh, mother. So being able to, so to, uh, to interconnect all those uh, social categorization um, is also um, a way to, to show, uh, to lead by example and to show that this is, this is indeed possible. Even if uh, I completely agree that uh, this focus on international intersectionality uh, is extremely important uh, as diversity is of course much more than a, a healthy gender balance, but we should also pay attention not to um, to, um, well, to talk about diversity and inclusion, but also to walk the talk, especially as at the end, diversity and inclusion are, are completely different concepts. Uh, diversity being, um, being invited to a party, while inclusion, meaning really to involve people and to, for instance, for a party, being ask, asked to dance or even being involved to, uh, in choosing their music. Where, and this is exactly the, the way where we should just so lead uh, our company and make sure that everybody is involved and, uh, and respected. Thanks, Julie. We have six minutes left, but I can't have a panel of six women CEOs and not wind us up with this last question, but maybe we do rapid fire what pops into your head in 20 to 30 seconds. And some of you actually already started to answer this in the context of the other questions, but um, here goes. The draft SSC and IFC guidance on gender equality highlights the importance of representation of having women in senior leadership positions. So what do you think women in leadership positions can and should do to promote greater gender equality? Uh, Delphine, we'll go back to you. Well, actually, I'll pinch my, uh, my remark from Julius because I, I think it's, it's very true. Um, I think the, our generation or this, uh, this period is a time for women in position uh, of leadership to be women. Whereas a previous generation or maybe us at the beginning had to have the, a bit of the male suit on our shoulders. And maybe it was some of our privileges uh, 
to be able to do that uh, because uh, we were able to, uh, we, we had other uh, privileges that, that made us uh, uh, be able to be in that competition for the next generation. Uh, we should ensure that uh, uh, this can be natural, including in the style of life, uh, work-life balance and uh, uh, soft skills that are promoted as feminine in, uh, in diversity with others, of course. And so, so make males a bit more feminine and get them have that uh, useful imposter syndrome that they sometimes lack. Well said. Julia, you got your comment pinched, so you have to be creative and come up with a new one. Well, I'm going to amplify, I think, a lot of what's been said, which is there's, there's been a nervousness, I think, uh, a concern that quite a lot of us have had that we'll get rolled out to talk about this agenda because you're the female CEO or whatever else. I think I would say embrace it. Don't resist it. You know, actually, if we're given the opportunity and we're given the mouthpiece and we're given the platform, we should embrace it. Um, and, and that's the sort of the, the lesson I'd leave you with. All right, Leila. Um, Mary, I think the most important thing that women uh, can do is to be an example to, to others. Um, uh, and that means excelling in, in what you do and showing others that um, you are able to reach the highest levels. And secondly, call out discrimination when you see it and be courageous and bold. Um, and women are uniquely positioned, women in leadership positions are uniquely positioned um, to make a statement and to call attention to discrimination. Great. Olga. I will add, lead by example, promote education between women, not only within the organization, but also outside the organization to prepare them for the opportunities that may rise and that we need to make for them as well. And Diana? Um, as women in leadership positions, we are involved all the time in hiring positions, in staffing positions. I think the best thing that we can do is to show everybody in the company and the management team that we value competence. Uh, above everything else. And if it is a, a diverse slate of candidates that we are considering uh, for the position, that we make our decisions based on competence. And so when we choose a woman for the job, uh, everybody will accept that it is because this is the best candidate. Um, I think that is the best thing that we can do for the cause. Yeah. Great, and Julie. Yes, well, I think we should we should all commit, and I think it was said today to a zero gender gap. Um, and I think that we also have a responsibility, if not a duty, uh, to teach women to to dare. Uh, and this, I think, by by role modeling, by um, mentoring, but also by funding those women. Great. Thank you. Well, we have one minute left, so I'm going to try to, to quickly close us. But first off, thank you to the panelists for a, a lively and thoughtful discussion. I could keep going another few hours <laughs> with you all. Uh, I think we heard a lot today about uh, the fact that exchanges have a key role to play to, to support gender equality. I'm not going to recap it given the time, but acknowledge that you know we realize it's not an easy journey. You know, I IFC as part of our, our broader ESG work has been pushing, or I guess I should say encouraging others to embrace the value of uh, gender diverse boards uh, by, through all kinds of channels, building capacity, supporting research, generating knowledge, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I also have to tell you quite honestly, a few years ago, we took a hard look at ourselves and uh, realized that we were lacking. <laughs> and that consequently inspired um, a redoubling of efforts internally and a much more comprehensive approach to, to strengthening the role of women on the boards of, uh, of our investee companies. And I'm, I'm excited to tell you that at the end of this past June, June, 2021, women now constitute 54% of IFC's nominee directors, which is 
well ahead of our, our corporate scorecard target of, of reaching parity by 2030. And, you know, I've been in IFC 17 years. I, I'm embarrassed to admit I wasn't entirely convinced we were going to be able to pull that off as quickly as, as we did. So now we must remain vigilant. Um, and maybe before I fully wrap up just to announce that I'm also super excited about the fact that soon we're going to sign a new cooperation agreement between IFC and the Sustainable Stock Exchange, which builds on the, the successful collaboration we've over, had over the, the last few years. So I, I, I really am, I have high hopes. I think it should contribute to, to better outcomes and of course contribute to our progress on, on the road to achieving the SDGs. So let me just close by, by, by thanking this, the SSE team and of course the World Investment Forum for the opportunity for us to have this chat and thanks to the panelists and, and to everybody out there in the audience. And with that, I'll, I'll pass the baton back to Anthony so that he can introduce the next session on policy and practice. But again, thank you all. Thank you for that, Mary. And uh, thank you again to uh, all the CEOs who joined us today. A super valuable conversation. Uh, we have, I think, 100 sessions at the World Investment Forum uh, this week, and I'm personally organizing about 15 of those. And I can honestly say that that uh, this conversation is uh, the one that I, I've been most looking forward to, and, and it did not disappoint in any way. Um, so really appreciated the, the contributions from everybody who was with us today. Um, but uh, we still have a very important discussion. I think in the first panel, we heard a lot about uh, from the, the view at the top, if you will, uh, and some of the big challenges that are being that are faced. Uh, Martine, I'd like to ask uh, the, the second panel for everybody to, to turn on their cameras and um, we'll start the second panel. I think there is now, uh, again, this view from the top, Martine, about the direction of travel. Uh, there's a obviously strong consensus. There's an identification of the challenges that people face. But what can we do about that? I think the, hopefully in this, this next panel, we can get into a little bit more of the uh, detailed uh, activities that uh, can be taken to really move the needle on some of the metrics that count around gender equality. So uh, let us, uh, let's see, let's restart everybody's videos. There we go. And we have one more person who needs to have their video. Really, let's see, Elsa. Okay, Melsa, Melsa, there we go, Melsa's there. So you're all, the, everyone's here. So with that uh, almost seamless transition, uh, I'd like to hand off to you, Martin, uh, and I look forward to hearing this discussion as well. Thank you, thank you very much, Anthony. I'm also looking very much forward to this discussion. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Valsain, and I manage ESG Advisory Knowledge and Learning at IFC. And I have the pleasure of moderating this uh, session on policy and practice today. Uh, just to maybe set the table of what's going on on the IFC side before we uh, start on the panel, um, for, seven for seven consecutive years, IFC and global partners, including SSC and stock exchanges around the world, participated in the Ring the Bell for Gender Equality, an initiative to celebrate International Women's Day a partnership that highlights how the private sector can spur women's participation in the global economy and promote sustainable development. As Mary mentioned, this collaboration with the SSC is now expanding to include the production of the G20 report that we've discussed today. And also under development is a toolkit for exchanges, which will provide a compilation of good practice examples of what exchanges are doing to foster gender equality and action stock exchanges and listed companies can take to move the needle in that space and promote SDGs. A joint global training program to grow this the pipeline of women leaders is also part of this effort. In our work to advance women leaders in capital markets, we have been doing our part. IFC is stepping up its work with stock exchanges to improve diversity in listed companies. We are also working to encourage the entry of more women into the workforce and ensure access to capital markets for women entrepreneurs. 
Working with stock exchanges and regulators, we have been able to move the needle on a broad range of areas, including training and mentoring programs, joint research studies, and the production of databases of women board directors. We have influence disclosure requirements to include data on women on boards and senior management, and corporate governance codes to include provisions for board gender diversity. Mary has already provided some example of some of this work on this uh, in her introduction, but I would like to highlight maybe three other examples. In Vietnam, we collaborated with the two stock exchanges and the State Securities Commission on the first corporate governance code for public companies. Notably, it includes a best practice provision for at least two female members or 30% female directors. In Egypt, IFC published a, a women on board research study where the Egyptian exchange was represented in the research advisory board. Findings and recommendations contributed to the decision of the Financial Regulatory Authority to amend the listing rules for all companies listed on the exchange, making it mandatory for them to have at least two women on board, uh, board members or 25% of the board. And finally, in Rwanda, IFC worked with the stock exchange in its capital markets regulator to include provisions for ESG and gender diverse boards in the code of corporate governance practices. So during this session, we'll be discussing policies and practices to increase gender equality that are currently underway. We'll try to gain a better understanding of what has worked and what hasn't, and where there is an opportunity to make a difference. Now, let me introduce you our esteemed panelists. Uh, first, we have Melsa Ararat, Global Advisory Board Member of the 30% Club and also an IFC friend. We have Wu Yu Li, Director of Marketing and Corporate Affairs at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Hope Jakorski, of, uh, Head of Equities at New York Stock Exchange. And Patricia Torres, Global Head of Sustainable Finance Solutions at Bloomberg. So I would like to kick off with a question for all of you. Gender equality is a human right and a sustainable development goal. We should not have to justify it. But we often hear that when speaking to the business community, we need to make the business case for gender equality. How does this business case look like? How are investors who are pushing for greater diversity, including gender equality, making the case? Do we have to tailor the argument for consider, to consider different factors such as uh, sectoral perspectives or national perspectives? I uh, would like to ask uh, maybe Melsa to kick us off on this question. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, I think the uh, discussions on the business case um, for gender diversity in decision making um, is something that we have to leave aside. I think there has been a, a growing uh, evidence that trying to empirically prove that adding one or two more women on a board produces uh, better firm outputs um, is extremely difficult. Um, in, in the previous panel, Julia has uh, made a comment, and, and I, I think that that was really important to uh, demonstrate that uh, we don't have any control group uh, to compare a predominantly male uh, dominated business organizations performing better or worse than otherwise uh, organizations that are uh, led by women or majority uh, women. So it's an extremely difficult case to prove anyway, but do we really need to prove that more women on decision-making groups improve decision-making in the case of listed companies? I, I don't think so. Uh, companies and, and the society live in a symbiotic relationship. If the societies are not healthy, uh, then the businesses cannot be healthy. Uh, I, I remember the case when we used to try to prove that uh, having independent board members on the boards were beneficial for the investors and beneficial for the companies. And despite thousands of papers, thousands of research papers that tried to prove that empirically didn't really lead us to anywhere but it did not stop anyone 
uh, and the investors believing in the case of board independence and the role of independent board members to monitor the executives and and the uh, and provide um, strategic uh, support to to the executives i think it is the same situation for same case for 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 women uh, the society we live in and 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 the economic system that we experience uh, have somewhat disappointed all of us that there has to be a change going forward and i think the change uh, in the economic system the change in the so social construct uh, and the governance of the businesses and the governance of the world affairs uh, need to look at everything from a different perspective which requires a significant contribution from the way women look at the issues and women look at the world so uh, I, I would I would think that uh, we don't need to convince uh, the business managers or the boards that more diverse boards are better for for the investors of the companies. First of all, uh, I think uh, they they are the ones who need to uh, leave the boards and and leave their place to uh, to other people. And that is not really easy. I, I, they have the pressure from the investors, they have the pressure from the society, and they are citizens themselves as well. And it's very difficult to argue against a moral argument because the, the, the case for diversity has moral superiority against the business case. So I would say that um, having a more just society where uh, everybody, uh, all, all the groups that have been so far left out of the decision making, economic decision making or political decision making, have to be included in the decision making processes, because we all recognize the fact that the decision making uh, for economic decisions and for, for political decisions around the world need to be improved because we are not we are not in a in a good place at the moment um, and i think the moral superiority of the case for diversity is strong enough and there's no need to try to go through numbers and try to empirically prove that diversity is good for business it's good for all of us it's good for the society it's good good for the economy and it's good enough Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing your thoughts. Maybe I can go to Rio next. Thank you very much, Martin, and good afternoon, everybody. I, I think Melissa has really said it all and, and captured my sentiment. I I feel that we we just cannot continue to live in a society where women are not equal partners, both in an economic and a social construct. It's unsustainable and um, for me, it just feels very unjust. And so the, the argument of having to uh, really put forward to businesses why they should be doing it just sounds, you know, counterintuitive for me. It, it, there is a moral imp imperative, but also there's a social imperative as well. Uh, and, and, and a business imperative comes in the form of it's good for the economy. Uh, it's good for the economy to have women to participate in the decisions around financials and 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 uh, the politics. It's good for the economy to have women uplift themselves or be up uplifted um, in terms of their ability to contribute to the uh, to to their country. Um, and if you need to actually have a business case, uh, you should just look at at companies where there is great female representation. And I know we shouldn't have to do this, but if you look at it, we see that. Companies which are, have good female representation have got very robust cultures. They've got very robust risk management and, um, and governance structures. And um, you know, they're able to drive the necessary behaviors to achieve the objectives. So absolutely, there, there is a benefit and uh, we just need to tell the story a bit more, but also stand our ground that from a moral perspective, it is critical. So thank you very much, Martine. Thank you. Hope, any other views uh, that you want to add to this uh, question? Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful discussion. I look forward to learning a lot during our session. I learned a lot during the last panel. Um, I think I would echo everything that was just said. Um, from my perspective, um, diversity is an inherently good thing, of course. Um, gender diversity, diversity of all kinds is really 
uh, diversity of thought and diversity of perspective. And so it's um, to some degree irrelevant, sort of whether you're talking about gender diversity, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, it's really the diversity of perspective and, and um, that can be brought to bear at a company and the benefit that that brings. Um, I know we're gonna get into a discussion later about what role exchanges ought to have. And so I look forward to that talk. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and Patricia, did you want to, to complement uh, some of uh, what the panelists have been saying? Um, I think that everything that has been said is extremely valuable, and, and I think we need to, to retain those messages. So thank you so much for inviting me to the panel. I think one thing that I would like to say is that we actually see that companies with greater female representation have less volatility. And the reason is because these companies are focused on retaining talent and they are being much more inclusive, which hopefully will impact the bottom line of, of the company. Um, so for me, is that the, the S side, so if we think about the investor community that we see like around us, we see that the investors are taking the letter S much more seriously. Unfortunately, we still don't have good data disclosure for the letter S. We don't have good standards for letter S, unfortunately, but we know that a lot of investors out there are actually taking notice of that and they're actually pushing for that S to exist much stronger than, than today. So an example, the legal and general is saying that they are voting against any company that has more less than 25% of their boards with women. So we're seeing BlackRock also taking action. We're also looking at different shareholders' proposals and, and the majority were linked to, to equality, to diversity and inclusion. We're starting to see compensations linked to, to diversity, which was something that was not seen before. So I think it's when one of your questions was about sector, is it something that should be, should we be dealing differently between a sector or, or a region? I hope not. I think we all have the right to leave. We all have the, the right to have opportunities in our own countries. And I really want to see that if we look from an investor-like perspective, we, we have to be global. We cannot say, oh, because we're in Japan, this is accepted. I don't think so. I think it's our job here to challenge those, those, those accepted beliefs and move them forward because there are several studies that are telling us if we don't change it, it will take us more than 100 years to reach our gender parity and we don't have 100 years. Uh, we have a couple of years. I think that we have to start making change it and changing beliefs. <laughs> uh, absolutely, Patricia, I agree 100% on that and also how you know, now investors are really putting their weight in the balance and trying to, to tip the scale a little bit and focus more on the, on the S. So uh, I think if there's one, um, you know, I would say benefit of the COVID crisis or very few is how, you know, more and more investors and in the world globally is, is very much focused on, on social issues. Um, now let's move to, to Hope. I have a question for you. Um, how does uh, the New York Stock Exchange think about gender equality and the role of the exchange? And can you give us some examples of things you are doing to promote gender equality? Sure, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think I'll echo what's already been said that while we still have a very long road to equality, um, we've made some progress on board diversity specifically. So I think I, would, I thought I would start with some encouraging news coming out of the US regulatory environment. Um, our NYC listed company community is held to the gold standard of governance. And of the companies that have listed on the NYC in 2021, 99% had at least one female board member. And as you look further down at the companies with two, three or more women directors, companies that list on the NYSE have greater representation than our US competitor. Um, I'll also note that the SSE's recent report on gender equality, um, the NYSE is the highest ranking North American exchange for gender balance on issuer boards. Um, and that's notwithstanding the fact that we don't have a listing standard or a disclosure requirement in place. So I think that that's all very encouraging news um, about what issuers are focused on with ESG more broadly, but especially gender diversity in particular, it's driven by investors. It's driven by um, uh, the pressure that companies are feeling um, from investors to, to, to do what they want, but also just what is um, viewed internally at listed companies is an inherently good thing to do. Um, so while with all of that said, from where we sit, 
our top competitor for bringing companies um, to the public markets is not um, our U.S. counterparts. It's really the private markets. And you know, the U.S. public markets are highly regulated and trusted, and that's because um, we have a robust disclosure and transparency regime in the public markets. Compare that with the regulatory regime for the private markets, um, which in which investors are provided far less information and protections, I would say. So um, anything that is done to inhibit a company from coming to the public markets and quite frankly, getting the discipline that the private, the public markets bring by disclosure requirements imposed by the SEC, by the exposure to the investor base, anything that is done to inhibit that, um, bringing that pipeline forward, we, we view as an inherently um, bad thing uh, where we, in, we you know, stand for democratizing access to the public markets and giving um, people of all backgrounds the opportunity to invest in the company and, and watch it grow and then join in its success. So we think a lot about um, what, you know, putting mandates in place, um, disclosure requirements in place at the exchange level, what that would do to um, discourage that pipeline of going public. So I hope that that puts that in, that in context. Um, that said, you know, regulation in this area is certainly part of the Biden administration agenda here in Washington, D.C. and in, in the United States. Um, that's it you know, perhaps the appropriate place for the SEC to bring these mandates forward rather than, than an exchange adopting um, a set of listing standards that, um, you know, we are, we are certainly not uh, domain experts in this area. And um, so it's our view that a listing standard is not really the appropriate way to advance these types of ideals. What we've been focused on for quite some time is really inherent to what an exchange does. We match, uh, we match counterparties. We match buyers and sellers who want to trade securities. In this context, we match issuers and investors. We literally sit at the center of the discussion between issuers and investors. We sit at the center of the discussion between issuers who are looking to increase the board diversity of their company um, with um, board candidates that are of a, you know that have a diverse background that are out there also looking for a company uh, in which they can uh, obtain a board seat. So we've really tried to harness the power that um, a, a, the power of community and the power of bringing different types of market participants together. So here's a, dis a distinct example. Um, a few years ago, we established a board advisory council. It's a council of around 40 of our listed companies, um, CEO level, and they provide um, an opportunity for, um, they, they essentially put their Rolodex into this pool of opportunities across their companies and other companies that, of which they're aware who are seeking board, uh, diverse board candidates. Um, we've placed numerous board candidates through that process. We also have an ESG advisory team at the NYSC. We have um, best, a best practices guide that we've put out. You know, our companies are hungry for this information. They're hungry for data. Um, which we are able to provide access to our ICE ESG reference data, ICE being the Intercontinental Exchange, our parent company. So um, we've really taken the approach of trying to harness sort of the, um, what we are best at as an exchange um, and bringing people together to try and tackle this problem. Thank you, Hope, for this. This is very interesting. Uh, just as a side note, I've worked uh, for about 17 years at Toronto Stock Exchange. And it's oh. always interesting to see the balance between, you know, what exchanges should do versus, you know, uh, securities commissions and regulators. So I, 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 tour, I, I it really echoed, your comments echoed uh, with me uh, very much. Um, now, Wuyo, uh, when we look at JSE as a company, it performs very well on diversity, including gender equality. So how does the exchange think about gender equality and what initiatives as it introduced to promote to promote greater equality either within the exchange or at the market level. Thank you, Martine. Um, and I think I want to repeat the statement that um, as a JSE, we recognize that we cannot live in an unjust society where women um, are not treated equally to men, uh, both economically and socially. And 
as such, uh, we decided that we are going to look at activities to embark on as the exchange uh, to progressing gender equality. So just on that, I think um, as a starting point in, in our strategy, we do have uh, a pillar that talks to leading on the national agenda. And we recognize that in South Africa, gender equality is one of the items on the national agenda but also when we're prioritizing the 19 sustainable development goals of the UN, uh, we've actually identified six that we've prioritized. And one of them is SDG five, which looks at gender equality. So this is the context in which we basically looked at gender equality as a critical uh, strategy pillar at, at the JSE. So absolutely right. We, we have two thirds of our board um, as, as women and 75% women in our executive team. So uh, on, on that point, I mean, we're starting from a position of strength and influence. And one knows that once you have a lot of women who are sitting at that position, you start to see much more progress in uh, ar areas pertaining to gender equality. It, there is a particular tipping point. And I do think as the JSE, we've actually worked on over that tipping point and uh, it would be, you know, uh, a miss of us not to actually use that, that benefit to, to benefit gender equality. So we've just embarked on a gender strategy that we, we want to articulate and we are working on currently. And it really looks at our role in three ways. So what is the role of the JSE as an exchange? What is our role in community? Uh, and also what is our role from a regulator perspective? Because we play all those, all, all those roles. And in, in, in that strategy, we've looked at what are the key elements that we see as elements that drive gender equality that we need to address. There are four of them, the three that I think we see internationally, the one being our gender representation. And I think we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion in that space. How well are women represented as senior executives and also in, in the different boards? Uh, we look at elements such as pay parity because we do think that that is one of the biggest barriers of gender equality and, and economic participation. And then the third one is uh, looking at how do we address the real issue of unequal caregiving uh, where women actually spend more time with uh, caregiving uh, and, and actually it's not, it's not balanced at all. And it does have an impact on ability to uh, participate economically, economically or to actually progress uh, in, in, in certain industries as well. So those are the three ones that we are looking at just from a, from a uh, global perspective. But you know, we also have another leg that we in South Africa, we have to look at, which is um, gender-based violence. And um, unfortunately, uh, South Africa has one of the highest incidences of gender-based violence. And it is something that um, at, at the JSE, we feel that we need to address as, as part of the strategy. So within those four pillars, uh, there's uh, a few things that we've done. Internally, um, we've definitely focused on uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've uh, looked at how we can increase the number of executives in the, in the board and also in the executive team, the C-suite. And this wasn't just coincidental, it actually was a concerted strategy as part of our transformation journey to say that we do need to actually see more women uh, participating at senior levels in the organization. Um, and it's, yeah, it's gone the, the 30, beyond the 30% that's, that's recommended. Um, and it's something that I can say that Leila and our previous CEO have driven quite well. Um, on the gender parity perspective, we do do surveys to look at our gender um, and on our payment, uh, whether it's by race or or by gender or other factors. And I think it's quite important that we do that to make sure that we progress the principles of equal pay for, for equal work. Um, and it's something we want to start encouraging other listed companies to, to actually do. Um, and then we're also looking at, um, the, on the unequal caregiving, we've got policies to address that. Uh, we, we are allowing our um, both male and female to take um, paid leave uh, when, when uh, um, parental leave. Um, and, and it might sound like a small thing, but it's quite a big thing because it also talks to changing uh, social norms and ideas about the role of men and women in raising the children. Um, and you, you also, uh, it also helps in terms of um, give men a bigger appreciation of the, 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 the juggling that we as women have to do in our daily lives. 
Uh, and I think it's part of the way of, of also removing unconscious biases and gender stereotyping in the workplace. So we are doing that. Um, we've got some robust policies that are dealing with um, sexual harassment um, and gender-based violence. One of the new things that we've done is the JSE, which um, a lot of companies haven't actually executed and we hope that we will role model it, is looking at um, a gender-based violence policy. So we've got a firm policy that we've introduced at the JSE that talks to how do we deal with perpetrators of gender-based violence in our organization, but also how do we support gender-based violence victims uh, who are in our organization as well, male, female, or otherwise. So we, we do have those policies in place. Um, and on top of that, we are looking at training programs for, for women to make sure we uh, assist with advancement and um, looking at how we can grow the number of female and, and, and Black-led uh, small, medium enterprises, because that's a huge uh, generator in, in the economy as well. And we're not seeing a lot of... Uh, Black female or female owned companies that are thriving. Uh, so that is that what you're doing inside in the organization. If you're looking at a community perspective um, and regulation perspective, I do agree with Hope that uh, being more prescriptive and, and, and setting certain targets in, in the listing requirements is not the way we want to go. Uh, but what we are trying to do is to encourage the conversation. So we are encouraging companies to, uh, to talk, uh, to disclose whether they do have a race and gender policy and also how they're tracking alongside them. We are also looking at maybe how we can push this a little bit further to say, um, let's encourage our listed companies to disclose their targets because currently it's not mandatory, but we believe we can play a role in encouraging um, companies to talk about that. And also talk about how they're doing with their remuneration and recruitment practices. How are they recruiting and also how are they paying uh, when you compare on the, the gender and the, the race uh, perspective. So uh, those are one of the elements we're looking at. We're looking at revising some of our listing requirements just to progress a little bit more on the gender equality front. Um, and on the community side, working with various uh, government institutions on how we can promote gender equality. We are a signatory on various um, uh, charters around gender equality representation. Uh, we're working on the advocacy side to see uh, government to, I mean, to encourage government to make the, the changes at national level uh, to promote gender equality. And we're also working with the Office of the President as well in some of the initiatives around um, gender-based violence. So it's a lot, uh, but we do think there's a lot that we can do. Um, and I actually look forward to uh, reading a bit more about some of the changes that the SSE is recommending in that front. So thank you very much, my team, back to you. Thank you, Ju. I have to say a very, uh, quite impressive list of initiatives uh, that uh, are uh, implemented or encouraged by uh, the JSC. Very, very impressive. And now let's talk maybe a little bit about data. So Patricia, you know, as we know, the availability of reliable data is an important uh, underpinning of company valuation and performance, as well as product constructions. Uh, do you find that the data is getting better? Uh, and what do we need to do in order to get robust data and information so that we as stakeholders can rely on it? And, and where have you seen any trends in terms of where uh, the growth and demand of data is coming from? Martina, it's a great question. Um, I was just looking internally into my systems to take a look at the e -S -S -G data. So we have for the e data, we have more than 550 data points for governance of 550. And for social, we have 185. So the question, so even, even now, if I drill lower to the gender part, is even much less. So I think we have clearly a problem with the letter S. So that's question number one. So that's, that's fact number one. So Bloomberg is about bringing data transparency, and we need to rely on frameworks. So another challenge that we have is we don't have a global framework. Every company discloses the data that they think they have to disclose to their stakeholders. Not every company is disclosing the same data across their industry or across the regions. So standardization of data and having this global framework is extremely important. And now, now let's go to the next layer. Let's say that the company is now disclosing and they are really strong in terms of diversity. And we have released um, our gender. Uh, so we have a GI, which I'll talk like in a second, but we also have our Bloomberg ESG scores. 
And on the G letter, we do board composition. So can we score companies based on gender and ethnicity? And so let's, let's, let's try to search how many companies are disclosing data. And then one of the things that we read was 30% of our board, 30 of our board is diverse. Okay, but what does diverse mean? <laughs> we don't even know if diverse means women, if, my, if diverse means minorities, disabilities, ethnicities, we don't know. So I think is, so we have a, a really big issue is there's lack of disclosure. And then for disclosure that people are giving and providing to the market, we don't have a consistent way of disclosing that information, which then brings us to the problem, which is how do investors co collect data and use this data to truly push, push engagement? And this is what took Bloomberg back in 2016, back 2016 to launch our gender reporting framework, what we call the GEI, the Gender Equality Index. So Peter Grauer, our chairman, um, really thought that we really need to change this. So he's also part of the 30% club and he's really trying to push women to say, we have to do something. So we came up with a, with a reporting framework. We have around six, 70 different metrics and we break our framework into five, five pieces. We're looking at, the pipeline of the women. So what is the pipeline today? Um, we are looking at harassment, as we talked about. We're also talking about inclusiveness and also the policies and incentives that we can give to women. Um, uh, and we're also talking about like the pro-women brands. What are, what are companies doing to invest in future generation of women that could come in and take, and take um, senior like positions? So with our framework, we're able to capture more data that is not currently being disclosed by the companies. It's a total voluntary framework. This, this framework, we're using it for public companies, but any, any company can use the framework as a starting point. And I think that our message to the companies is we don't want to send you a survey for you to fill in a survey. And then how many surveys do you get anyway? You probably get five, six, seven, eight different surveys. We are trying to say, can we just work all together and come with a framework that all of us can adopt because if we, all of us can adopt then we as a data vendor we can collect the data that is accurate and then i can feed it back to the investment decision portfolio construction portfolio optimization uh, asset allocation and i think what we're missing is that this is what the thing that is missing is that currently we don't have this global framework no one is using one there is no transparency even the data that it is is not comparable and, and therefore we feel that there's a lot of room for growth. Um, I think there's a huge appetite in the market for that as well, but we just have to come together to make sure that we collectively stop sending service to each other. We agree on a global common framework. We start collecting that information. Everybody knows what those metrics mean. And then we can actually finally get this data nourishing to the investment decision of the different portfolio managers out there. I think that's, that's, that's what we're advocating for is getting the data that is timely, consistent, audited. There's another problem. The data comes out and sometimes the data is not actually correct. So, and machine readable, because then if it's machine readable, I can just push the machine, take the data out and the data that I'm providing is 100% accurate. At the moment, I have to employ people to go and go through the 500 different page reports to try to find where is the metric? It was so funny. Like today, I was in a meeting like with a client and, and we're talking about carbon emissions. Carbon, they said, but that data only represents seven of our buildings. So how are you comparing this data? I say, oh my God, you are telling me that the data that you are publishing only represents seven of your buildings. So that's a red flag. So I think we want to get rid of those red flags. So we want transparency, comparability, and really strong quality data to really advance the agenda. Because if you don't measure these, you have no progress. You are not accountable. You are not publishing your targets. You only have a narrative, but you don't have a substance to say, this is my starting point. This is where I want to go. And every year I'm going to start reporting on my progress. And that's what I feel that we're missing. It's over to you, Martin. With you. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Patricia. I think, uh, you know, ESG reporting is a bit of the far west and a bit of an alphabet soup. So, you know, we hope that uh, you know, the announcement made uh, in respect of the IFRS Foundation stepping in and trying to, to provide uh, some guidance and a framework and, 
uh, like we like we like we are for uh, financial statements. For me, that information is as important as the financial information that a company puts out. So hopefully, we'll see some. We'll have some good news, and maybe in a few years we can reconnect and and hope that we'll have be better data. So now I will ask Melsa to tell us a bit about the Thirty Percent Club. Um, what is it trying to do, and what do you try to achieve uh, with uh, with this initiative? Thank you. Well, what, what an inspiring bunch uh, there, there are there. Uh, very happy to hear um, what uh, JSC has been doing and, uh, and also hearing Patricia about uh, Bloomberg's uh, future plans because 30% club uh, members in many countries work closely with, with Bloomberg. Uh, and perhaps uh, one way to go forward with the data is to have scope one, scope two, and scope three gender uh, disclosure. Uh, because, of course, all these comprehensive uh, questions that Bloomberg's index uh, requires to, to be answered by the companies, very difficult to be uh, available or made available by uh, by all the companies around the world but we still need to have the scope one <laughs> and the scope one should include of course uh, the board data yes we have it's it's available for all the listed companies but we do need this uh, the the management uh, data as a minimum and also uh, gender pay gap and i think gender pay gap reflects uh, the differences between um, the level of women and men in the organizations, uh, and, and, and it is a key metric that, just one metric that captures a lot of uh, the problems or, or the goodness in the organization. So uh, very happy to, to hear that. Well, coming to the 30% club, well, I'm, I'm on the Global Advisory Board, but I'm also the founder of the Turkish chapter uh, and the chair of the steering group. Uh, and uh, the 30% Club is, is a campaign, basically a campaign, uh, led by chairs and the CEOs of uh, listed companies around the world. Uh, and as you probably all know, that it was initiated in the UK, but now there are 17 chapters around the world, and there is a MENA chapter, which I think covers quite a number of companies, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, East Africa, Hong Kong, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Poland, South Africa, of course, Turkey, United Kingdom, and United States. And, and today uh, we just announced the, the setting up of the uh, Ecuador chapter. And Latin America is a very, very fertile, uh, I would say, um, land for 30 plus, 30% uh, club uh, activities. The, the, the global mission of the, of the club is uh, to, to uh, achieve 30%, at least 30% representation of all women on all boards and C-suites globally. Uh, and the club would like to do that by uh, activating chairs and CEOs uh, of, of the listed companies as members um, and influence those uh, with power to drive the change. So it's more, I would say, a leadership initiative and that bringing forward the leaders uh, who have uh, believed in uh, the benefits uh, and, 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 and the requirement for an inclusive and diverse uh, organization uh, and put them on the, on the, on the, on the uh, screen uh, and also enable uh, future uh, women leaders. Uh, the club supports diverse, diversity in its very broadest sense, uh, and of course, uh, gender has been the starting point. But recently, uh, the club realizes that considerations of ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background uh, are all part of the discussions around uh, inclusiveness and diversity. And, and the, the premises is that uh, the truly inclusive cultures of the organizations or organizations that value inclusiveness and diversity uh, can reach their full potential because they, they can make use of uh, the talent from different uh, segments of the society without prejudice and without discrimination. And that will contribute also to the society uh, in a, a spillover effect uh, through the organizations uh, and, and their stakeholder uh, relations. 
Um, what the club does, um, of course, every country is different. Uh, when I was looking at the uh, discussions um, going around, what exchanges can do and, and how investors can be mobilized to promote gender diversity or, or, or diversity and inclusiveness in general, I think we have to recognize the differences between different uh, jurisdictions, different different markets, different companies, uh, and something very important uh, I, I must add here is is the is the ownership structures of the companies. When we look into um, G20 uh, and the exchanges in G20 countries and how companies and exchanges perform uh, perform with respect to diversity, we see that in countries where ownership is dispersed. Uh, institutional investors represented, uh, representing eventually, the, of course, the citizens uh, have an influence on the way the boards are constructed. They, they are very, very uh, concerned about who sits on the board and the, whether the boards are uh, function well. And we see that um, without um, a, a legal quota in, in those countries, the US, uh, Australia, Canada, we, we have good representation of women on the board, thanks to investors' uh, activism in that respect. But in other countries where uh, the companies are predominantly controlled by a controlling shareholder or families, uh, this investor pressure actually doesn't work. And that's why we see in the G20 countries that uh, European countries or European exchanges uh, we have uh, mandatory quotas to derive the change because if if the markets don't function in promoting what we consider as as being optimum, then there has to be some sort of uh, intervention to to regulate. Uh, and therefore, in every thirty plus uh, thirty percent club chapter, uh, the chapters have their own means and their own approaches to promoting gender diversity. Uh, in the boards and in the in, in also the the the, the, the suits. Um, we also have a, a recent initiative um, to set up a global investor uh, action. Uh, each chapter, uh, we have about eighteen chapters, as I mentioned. Uh, there are about eleven chapters uh, that actually has an investor group. And those investor groups, uh, of course, communicate with the key investors in their uh, markets, uh, mobilize them, help them, support them uh, to make sure that there's progress toward, towards uh, better diversity and inc inclusiveness. Uh, now we are trying to bring the global investors together uh, so that in a similar way that, for example, we had in climate action, that the global investors can actually uh, put pressure on economically important companies around the world to change their policies if they uh, those policies haven't led to a diverse uh, organization and diverse uh, management and, and, and the board. Uh, we have uh, actually this uh, tomorrow, a meeting scheduled with representatives of uh, the global uh, key investors, uh, together with the head of our uh, investor groups around the world, to discuss what kind of a, a mission statement or a mandate uh, that we would propose that uh, the uh, investors, global investors, who would like to be a part of this global, uh, global action, uh, would uh, subscribe to. Uh, and also, what should be the focus? Um, of course, gender uh, is applicable in every uh, chapter, in every every country, every market. Uh, but every uh, country has its own uh, uh, important uh, dimensions of, of uh, diversity and inclusiveness. So the question uh, to be discussed in tomorrow's meeting is also, uh, how are we going to promote diversity, in, in, in what dimensions, and what should be the type of actions that, that, uh, that the group should be undertaking. So we're hoping to set up a global steering group uh, of key investors who would lead the way. Um, and hopefully uh, 
this would also have an influence uh, in uh, the local investors. Uh, in some countries, they have been quite silent. We, we know that the global investors have been pushing. I was just reading a research recently that the companies where the, the big three investors, uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, have higher percentage of uh, shares. Uh, actually have improved their board diversity and, and uh, senior management diversity much higher than the other companies. So investors do matter, but investors don't matter everywhere in the same way. <laughs> so we still have this controlling shareholders, families, uh, and also lenders are very important. IFC plays a very important role. EBRD plays a very important role. For example, in Turkey, we work very closely with uh, EBRD, uh, also with, with uh, IFC, of course, but with the EBRD, we are trying to make sure that uh, as uh, Vuyo mentioned, uh, that the companies who are borrowing or the companies that have uh, public money invested in them have, for example, policies against uh, gender-based harassment and, um, and violence. It's, it's very, very important because at the end, the gender discussion, the gender uh, diversity discussion discussion as we agreed i think in the first part of the of the of the panel is is a social justice issue and if that is the case the social justice should look into where not being just presents itself manifests itself it, if it manifests in itself with gender norms that are limiting the gender norms that that that, that are constraining uh, and also the cultural norms uh, norms that that puts barriers in front of women uh, and when you look into organizations and when you want women to have uh, ambitions to to be at the top and to contribute to the success of their business you, you want them to compete with their male counterparts or male male um, uh, male colleagues under the same uh, conditions, which is not the case. The, the, the burden of unpaid work uh, at home and, and the burden of the social norms, cultural norms on women uh, put a lot of constraints. So I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, the club uh, in different countries where these issues matter, as we do as 30% club in Turkey as well, to be a part of uh, the requirements from the companies that investors invest in or lend money to, to have gender equality policies in place that takes into consideration whatever issues matter in, in, that, in that country. Thank you, Melsa. I think, uh, first of all, I find it very interesting how also the 30% club is going you know, beyond gender diversity, which I think was the initial mandate. Yeah. And I had never made that connection between ownership structure and you know what type of actions uh, can work better. So having a diffuse base of shareholders versus uh, concentrated shareholdings, I think that's very interesting. And I totally agree that you need to to use all the levers that you have at your disposal. And you know investors, especially uh, large institutional investors, can can really uh, help like move the needle on some of those. Um, you know, some of those policies. So, so thank you for that very interesting update of what's happening at the 30% Club. Uh, being mindful of the time, we have about six minutes left. Um, I will have a question for all that maybe we can try to, to answer more in a rapid fire type of uh, style. So my question is around, okay, we've made some progress, right? In terms of women representation on boards in many jurisdictions, not all of them. However, when you look at the data from the G20 report, we can see that, you know, women leading, uh, you know, uh, leading companies or in senior management, there's still a, very much a lot of progress to be done. And I would like to get from the panelists your views as to what are some interventions in your experience that have worked uh, in order to address the problem of women in senior management. Um, I will start with uh, Patricia maybe on this question. Thank you, Martin. Um, so for us, our GEI, so like I'm just going to base my response on our insights from the last gender equality framework that we launched last year. And building pipeline, female pipeline is by far the thing that we have seen companies need to do 
to make sure that the gender um, equality improves in the organization. I think it's really important that we have the tone comes from the top, but it's just one of those elements. Um, and it's relatively easy to hire people. The problem is it's much more difficult to retain the talent than just hiring. You can hire an executive, you can hire people at the entry level. We, do, we don't see, so in, in all the companies that responded to the GI, which were 460 last year, we don't see a problem at the base, we see a problem at the top. So we, companies tend to hire a lot of people, but for some reason, the talent does not move upwards to the organization. Um, and one of the findings, we're trying to contrast um, which type of roles an organization needs to have, and then where do we have the highest correlation? So we see that companies with more than 30% of female board members, they have 7% more female executives on average, but that was not the, 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 the data metric that was relevant. The data metric that was relevant was the percentage of women in the top 100% compensating roles and the percentage of women in revenue producing roles. And when we saw those two numbers high, the senior management was high. And the reason is because you as a female, when you are in, a, in an organization, you, you need to be able to look up and see someone senior like on the top for you to say, I should stay, I have a space in this organization. So just to summarize, investing in pipeline, female pipeline is extremely important. Thank you, Patricia. Hope, any insights that you wanna share with us? I'm so sorry, I, I was muted. Um, I'll echo um, what Patricia mentioned, you know, that we at, at iStata Services, we have a, a GEI as well um, and providing access, you know, again, kind of the matchmaking function between issuers and investors, that's, um, that's one thing. Another um, really discreet example that I'll mention <clears throat> that really expands beyond the listed, you know, the, the role that exchanges can play beyond the listed company is the trading community. Um, there is a, a, a lack of diversity with respect to participation in IPO allocations um, by women owned broker dealers and banks, um, diversity owned broker dealers and banks. Um, so we think a lot about what, separate from what we do with it, within our listed company community, what can we do to, it, um, to invest in bringing more diversity to the trading community that is part of the New York Stock Exchange? Um, a very discreet example that exemplifies this is we um, accepted a new, a new trading member to our community this summer, um, Tigris Financial Partners, which is not only a, a women-owned broker-dealer, it is the first women-disabled uh, female-owned broker-dealer in the country. And not only did she want to become a member of the New York Stock Exchange, she also wanted to be on the floor, which is, you know, the, um, you know, gives her and her firm, and not just her firm, but also her, her clients who by their very nature are more diverse, gives them a platform, gives them a megaphone um, from our community. So we think a lot about ways to expand what we do beyond just you know, how we facilitate conversations within our listed company community, um, but you know, beyond with investors and the trade, our trading partners more broadly. Thank you for that, Hope. Um, Melsa, did you uh, want to provide a, a few examples of things that, that work? Uh, I, I think disclosure is probably the most important enabler. Um, uh, and I, I was just reading a, a recent research again about the importance of the pipeline uh, composition. Uh, the percentage of uh, women uh, on, the, on the board uh, produces better results or is correlated with better results if the pipeline is also diverse. Uh, that disclosure is very important, but I would again uh, want to emphasize the importance of uh, the ownership structures. Uh, entrenchment is very important. I would say that if uh, if I would like to change just one thing <laughs> about the capital markets regulations for listed companies, I would just put um, a limit for, for tenor, board tenor, average board tenor, especially in, in, in uh, concentrated ownership settings uh, where families uh, own majority of the shares in the companies. You see people sitting in the boards for 30, 40, 50 years. 
uh, and sometimes uh, more than one family member sit on the board uh, and, and then you, you have like majority of the board members sitting there forever. So the entrenchment of the boards by concentrated uh, shareholders is a major issue. Yes, of course, we would, uh, we would need to first uh, bridge uh, um, um, make the bridge between investors and issuers by um, mandating disclosure, uh, I think that's very important. Uh, and of course, Bloomberg has done a great job in identifying those disclosure items. But if we were to do just one thing, I would just say that, well, limit average board tenure. So if somebody has to sit there for 40 years, then at least the others has to change more often. And therefore, they can open space for younger, um, for, 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 for different background, people from different backgrounds. We need to prevent entrenchment of the boards because this, this is what kills the business. This is what kills the economy, I think. Mm. No, I agreed on that, Nasa. Very good point. Uh, we're a, a little bit over time, but I still want Buyo to, to chime in on this question before we close up the session. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it's been a great session so far. Um, I was clapping my hands when Patricia and, and Melsa mentioned the pipeline, because I think that is critical. Uh, it is difficult to see more women in uh, listed environments uh, heading up as CEOs if you don't see a pipeline of women who've actually shown experience, not only in the HR, the marketing spaces where you see most women being appointed at senior levels, but in revenue generating core operating uh, spaces. So it's going to be quite important for organizations to look at their own composition of ESCOs and say how many women are actually running the revenue generating part. So that, that is quite critical. Otherwise, we won't make the shifts. Um, I, I also think that from a governance perspective, a lot of uh, people, where they find the barrier to joining the boards is while they've got the experience from an executive perspective, they don't have experience in governance. And it's going to become important to see if the other programs that you could uh, launch to help train in, in corporate governance and the likes, and what companies, especially large companies can do who have got many subsidiaries, is start putting women to in the boards of those subsidiaries to give them the necessary experience so that when they actually want to sit in a board outside of their organization, they've got the experience and they can actually cut through that, that barrier. And then the last part, and I suppose it's more of um, flipping the script because we always say, what can we do for women? But I think what can we do for ourselves as women is looking at things like sponsorship uh, in terms of uh, getting the right sponsor who can put you forward when the big roles come up, uh, looking at things like coaching, and lastly, exposure through key impact projects. Because it's once you've shown to do something that somebody is willing to actually take an interest in putting you in those senior management roles. I remember a, a, a male mentor of mine once said, you know, the problem with women is that um, in particular senior roles is we don't have the confidence to actually put our hand up for that big role because we want to be 100% ready. Whereas a guy only just needs a sponsor and to be 50% ready to get in. So it's also us in ourselves to say, let's look for those sponsors. Let's look for those opportunities of exposure um, and start actually uh, role modeling that behavior so that more people can follow us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vuyo. Uh, I think now we're gonna have to close this panel. It was a very interesting discussion. I, I learned a lot from all of you and I hope that uh, those who tuned in uh, has as well. But one thing that is clear is there are many pieces to this puzzle, right? Like what the exchanges can do themselves in terms of being an example and also at the market level, organizations such as the 30% Club trying to leverage also investors as a lever to deliver more gender uh, diversity and also the role of disclosure and, and data. I think that's absolutely key. So I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see a bit more movement, especially on the disclosure and data front. I think that will be a major uh, breakthrough in order to, to reach the, you know, the other level. So again, thank you so much for your participation today and I wish you all a wonderful uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Martin.